This is the Roots and All podcast, here to help you get growing. Join us as we explore everything plant-related, both indoors and out, and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Presented by Sarah Wilson. Hi, and welcome to episode three of the Roots and All podcast. Today I'm talking to Paul Hetherington of Bug Life. He's the Director of Fundraising and Communications over at the charity and he has worked in the nature conservation sector for the past 10 years. He's a regular media interviewee and public speaker on the work to save invertebrates and he's also a keen organic gardener and chair of his local allotment association. And today I'll be speaking to Paul about what you might think is a slightly dry subject but hopefully you won't find it to be. I'm talking about the subject of worms in your garden. Thank you for joining me, Paul. Can you explain a little bit about Bug Life and what it does? Bug Life is an invertebrate conservation organisation. We're one of only two in the entire world who look after all invertebrates. And we particularly at the moment focus on pollinators, fresh water and species at risk of extinction. We are international, although most of our work is in the UK. And what is your role over there? I am the Director of Fundraising and Communications. I'm also responsible for all of our engagement activities. So I am interested in talking to you specifically about worms in the garden. And I believe that from a little bit of research, they're known as free worms. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, there's two basic types of worm that you're likely to find. There's flatworms and there's what are known as either round or earthworms. So the round worms and the flatworms and the earthworms, they're all things that we would find in the garden. Is that right? Roundworm is another name for earthworm. You will find both of those in the garden. So do we know how many different species there are of earthworms in the garden? In the UK, there are 27 species of earthworm. In Europe, there are over 200 of them. So an enormously large number, really. How is it that we have not that many? Are, are many more adapted to hotter climates? It'll be about climate, about conditions. A lot of earthworms are very specific about what they eat. So obviously you've got different plant matter in different parts of the world. Bear in mind, Europe goes right into sort of cold areas like the top tens of Scandinavia, into the Russian zones, down into sort of almost Asian areas, Turkey, the Mediterranean. So you've got a huge range of different climates and conditions. So you're going to have different food sources and different needs to be able to adapt to local conditions. I'm a gardener, so I quite often come across worms during my day. Is there anywhere that I can go online to identify the species that I find? Because I do find a big wide range and I know that there isn't a massive amount of information out there. So I wondered if there was an online resource. There are two things you can do. If you take a photo, you can send it into iSpot and their experts have a look at it and come back to you and tell you what it is. The other thing is for basic earthworm identification on the Opal Explore Nature website, there is a basic earthworm guide and that covers all the common species. People who've been using it have got about a 66%, so about two-thirds success rate of actually identifying the worms against it. They're not easy things to identify. No, I can imagine. Talking about worms in the garden, I think probably I know the answer to this, but are they good for the garden? Yeah, they're extremely good. I mean, we think of worms as some sort of fleshy soil processing tube, and at one level that's exactly what they are, but they're much more than this. Each one of them eats a different thing. They live in different places and they've got different life cycles. They all actually are quite different when you get to look at them. Now, a study that's been carried out looking at the effect earthworms have on production, shows a 75% increase in plant material if you've got worms in the soil. Now, that's a huge increase. That's almost doubling the amount of plant growth as a result of having the earthworms there. So that's a huge, huge increase. The last book Charles Darwin wrote was The Importance of Earthworms. It was called The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms. So it really shows that for a long time they've realised how important they are. And and also some of the the earthworms, the ones that burrow really deeply, also play quite a strong role in reducing the amount of soil erosion that happens. So absolutely fundamentally important for putting life into your soil, if you like. So when you say that there's a 75% increase in plant material that's found where there are earthworms, does that mean if, say, there are no earthworms, then the 
plants per square meter is just going to be much less than if there were a, a good healthy population in that area. Yeah, I mean, the, the bigger of your crops, the amount of food that you're going to produce from that area, the amount of flowers you're going to get from that area will be greatly reduced if you haven't got the earthworms putting natural fertilizer back into the ground. I mean, I suppose you can combat that to an extent by using artificial fertilizers, but of course, there's a whole raft of other issues that you get into if you start doing that kind of thing. So in a garden setting, if I don't have quite, you know, such good earthworm population and I'm talking about it affecting the amount of plants that I have, does it also affect the growth that those plants that are there actually put on? Has any studies been conducted into that? Yes, it very much affects how much the plant that you have grows. So if you've got soil that's got very, very few earthworms in it, your plants are going to be much slower growing and they're also likely to suffer from nutrient deficiencies. So you'll get yellowing of leaves, spotting of leaves, all kinds of issues will occur if you haven't got the earthworms there because they make sure you've got the right balance of nutrients in the soil. They are nature's natural recyclers, if you like. That's fascinating. Obviously, we want more earthworms. So what can we do to encourage them into our gardens? It's very important that we do encourage them to garden. Now, there's several things that they don't like. So if ground gets compacted down really hard, it's very difficult for them to move through it. And that's why a light amount of forking of your soil is actually quite good for earthworms because it breaks it up a bit, it allows air in and it allows water to drain through. I don't know how you've been in the recent floods, but certainly where I am, the amount of water that's been there brought all the worms to the surface. And I was walking across a playing field and on the path there, it was absolutely littered in worms that had to come out of the ground because otherwise they were going to drown. In the floods in the Somerset levels, after the floods had cleared, there were farmers appealing, can you get me earthworms? please can you get me earthworms because all the worms are drowned because they've been underwater for so long and the other thing that's really important is they do need organic matter on the surface because they like to take it from the surface and pull it down into their burrows and eat it so being too tidy in your garden is also not good if you sweep up all the, the dead leaves and everything like that and take it away all the time you're not really helping your earthworms But it's interesting that you say about the earthworms in the recent rain. I'm actually having some landscaping done at home and a digger's been in and has created, we've got horrible clay soil and it's created a complete pan and therefore almost a swimming pool. And I actually found a worm on my window, my ground floor window. So he was making a bid for freedom. So yeah, they really, really don't like it. And actually that was going to be one of my daft questions to ask you because I quite often go after there's been a rainfall, I can walk along kind of unmade track or something somewhere like that and I'll find worms in puddles and I'll actually hoik them out because I did assume that they would drown so that is a case is it if there's just too much water in the soil they will actually drown yes that's why they come up to the surface I mean you know they can survive on the water a lot longer than a human can on the, and a lot of creatures but long sustained spell on the water and they will drown So the other thing that obviously I do a bit of as a gardener, and I try to minimise it, but I can't always, is I do a lot of digging when I'm weeding and when I'm planting and preparing soil. Is that a good thing for the worms or would it be better if I didn't dig anything at all? It helps to aerate the soil. It improves drainage. One of the things that it can do that's detrimental is if you dig all the organic material in so there's nothing left on the surface, that's not good for them. And the other thing that's not good is if you dig down too deep. If you dig down really deep, you're going down and you start to damage the burrows of the deep burrowing worms and so forth, and then you're causing them problems. So it's a bit of a compromise. And how deep are the deep burrowing worms? They can literally go down four or five feet if the, if, the, if the ground goes deep enough. This is how they play an important role, in fact, in anchoring soils that are at risk of erosion. Yeah, OK. So obviously mulching is a good thing in the garden. Again, is there anything specific that worms particularly like to, you to mulch the soil with? Well, each worm has a slightly different diet. They, they like something else. So you really want something that's got a good variety in it. So probably it's not so good to do, uh, you get things like coconut shells as mulches. They're probably not particularly good for earthworms because they're not really what earthworms in this country are used to eating. So try and get something that's a little bit more, you know, native if you can, because that's going to be better for them because it's going to be far more digestible. So we all kind of see the robins following us around when we were digging in the winter. And I just wondered actually what else feeds on earthworms? A tremendous 
particularly large number of creatures actually eat them. There's the flatworms, which we might talk about later. There's badgers, robins, as you've mentioned, blackbirds, song thrushes, starlings, woodcocks, curlews, some of the gull family, crows, ground beetles, centipedes, foxes, frogs, grass snakes, hedgehogs, leeches, lizards, mice, minks, moles, newts, wow. pigs, <laughs> pine martins, foxes, shrews, slow worms, smooth snake, road beetles, stoats, toads, wild boar, wood ants, and even carnivorous slugs. Who'd have thought it? That is incredible. So we really, really need them. They are obviously a very important food source for our other species. So in view of that, I'm very kind of against using anything chemical in the garden where I absolutely don't have to. But are there any chemicals or indeed biological controls that we use in our gardens that might be detrimental to the worms? Well, fungicides are particularly bad for them because a lot of worm diet is actually eating the the fungi that are part of the decay of the organic matter on the ground. So fungicides are not going to be good for them because they're going to be destroying their food. Uh, The majority of pesticides are not good for earthworms. They're never particularly species specific. So if you're spraying for aphids or something, it's going to wash off onto the ground. Some of it's going to spray onto the ground. It's going to get into the ground. That's not good for them. Again, herbicides are not great. Basically, virtually no chemicals are. Again, a lot of treated seeds have got inbuilt chemicals in them, which can be quite harmful for them. There are signs of a marked decline, for instance, in the earthworm density in areas of intensive agriculture. Uh, And these are obviously areas where there have been high usage of chemicals. So there is definitely a a knock-on and a a long-term effect. Wow, that is unbelievable, really. As I say, I I do shy away from using anything like that, but... I didn't realise the impact was quite that massive. So another good reason to kind of avoid things that we don't need to use. The other thing that I was trying to find information about online, because I was interested in conducting an earthworm count in my own garden, I did find the website of another group who deal with earthworms, but I wasn't, as I say, being a bit wussy with anything chemical and anything that's kind of harmful, their method that they suggested was digging a pit really to conduct the survey. And then if you wanted to have the species identified, then you you basically needed to kind of kill the worms that you found, which for me is a little bit unpalatable to say the least. I just wondered actually, is there another way of doing a worm count that's maybe slightly smaller scale and isn't quite so destructive to the worms? Yes, there is. And, and in fact, the Opal website that I mentioned earlier has a fairly decent basic worm ID guide, has got a how to do it. And the suggestion is you find a, a 20 centimetre square and you dig that out to a depth of about 10 centimetres. You then search through that dugout soil, so stick it in a wheelbarrow or something like that, search through it and find out how many worms are in there. And you just count those worms. And that will give you all of the shallow based worms. Now, if you want to find out about the deeper living worms, what you can do, and this irritates but doesn't harm a worm, is if you get a bit of mustard powder, mix it up with water, fill the hole up with it, let it settle down. And once it's settled down, those worms, because it's a bit itchy, a bit irritating, will come to the surface. You can then count your deep worms as well. I personally wouldn't do the, the deep worm count because I just don't like doing that kind of thing at all. But you could certainly count your, your higher level worms just by digging that soil out, rooting through it in your wheelbarrow, counting how many worms you are, and then you put it all back, obviously. And don't, don't do it if it's really, really cold because you know, they are susceptible to freezing. And don't do it if it's really, really hot and dry because, again, they may dry out. In a sample of that size, what would you say was a kind of healthy amount of worms to find? It'll depend a bit on your soil type, whereabouts in the country you are, but anything over 2,000 earthworms per square metre, now we're dealing with a size smaller than a square metre here, a 20 by 20, is overpopulated. But earthworms basically never tend to overpopulate because if the population gets high, they slow down their rate of breeding. So they are actually quite good at self-control. Anything under about 20 is a very low sort of score. But I mean, there are places where you might only find five. So it will depend very much on your soil type, the ongoing conditions in the area that you're doing your surveying. And does the acidity or alkalinity of the soil affect them at all? 
Yes, that's quite an important factor. Worms don't like very acidic soils. So if you're in a peaty type area, for instance, where it's kind of fairly high in acidity, you will have far less earthworms than if you're in a, in a, in a more alkali area. I just wanted to go back to a couple of my daft questions, which do relate to me personally as a gardener. I remember reading somewhere, I can't remember where it was, but it's the, somebody basically said a dry worm is a dead worm. And sometimes when I'm kind of on my travels, I do find these dusty, dehydrated looking worms. And I don't know what's the matter with them. I don't know if they're ill or if they've just forgotten which way is down, but I generally just kind of give them a bit of a wash and then <laughs> stick them somewhere shady. Do you know why? Sometimes they seem to be, you know, just floundering. They may have got out onto the surface and dried out. They may have got frosted. Out. Both getting frosted and getting really, really baked have that kind of effect on them and that will dry them out. And then they need to get back into the soil fairly quickly or they will die. And you will often find them dried, dried out completely and dead. And the other curiosity that I find with worms is that sometimes I'm digging and I will find a really bright pink worm that looks as if it's tied itself in a knot. Is that normal? Is that a particular species? Is that what they do? Have you come across those? Remember that, for instance, worms can actually self-fertilise as well. So it could well be a worm effectively mating with itself. If it's one worm, if it's two together, then it's a pair of worms mating. So it's kind of getting the two reproductive organs together. So it's most probably that is the reason for it. The other reason worms tend to curl in on themselves is if something's irritating them. For instance, if they were in a very acidic environment, then they'll start curling in on themselves. So there's a number of reasons they may be doing that. So moving on from the, my ridiculous experiences with worms in the garden, the other thing that I don't know anything about, and again, I've tried to do a bit of reading around it, but it's the worms that you find in compost. And I think probably most people can recognise the bright red ones that just seem to appear from nowhere in the compost. But are they completely different to earthworms? And again, do you know how many species there are of worms that are specifically making their habitats in compost heaps? The 27 species of earthworms in the UK include the, the compost worms. They can basically be bought, broken down into three different types. There's the classic earthworm, which is what you tend to dig up when you're digging. There's the humic earthworm. That's the one that tends to live in compost heaps, decaying matter, leaf litter, rotting wood, manure, anything of that nature. And then the final type is the deep burrowing earthworm. And they're the ones that you burrow down really, really deep. So the ones that go in the compost, the humic worms, they are presumably a good thing to have in your compost heap, are they? Yes, the more you have in there, the quicker things break down. So it, it, it's a really, really good thing to have. Right. And obviously, if you've got a... I, I've got a plastic bin and I put my compost, my household compost waste in there, and I've started it from scratch, and I know that within no time at all, it will be full of red worms. Where do they come from? Now, that... Is actually a very pertinent question because it's generally perceived that they've come up out of the soil underneath the bin, but studies have actually shown that if you have a bin that's completely sealed across the bottom, you will start to get these worms appearing in there. And the only conclusion is that they've come in in some way, maybe as eggs, maybe as very, very small worms attached to some of the organic matter that is thrown into the compost bin. And then once they're in there, they start to thrive and they start to reproduce. So with that in mind, could I actually buy some of those worms to put on my compost heap? Indeed you can. There are nowadays quite a number of different places you can find online who sell worms online and then send them through the post to you. Okay. And the other worry that I have when I do spread my compost around is that I'm adding those to my vegetable patch or wherever. And I do feel a little bit guilty because I think, well, actually, you know, I'm now putting you in an environment that you not, might not necessarily have chosen to be in. Are they going to survive or will they gradually die off once they hit the normal environment of the garden? It's a mixture. Some will survive, they'll get into the soil, they'll move away and they'll find another really nice humic area. And some won't get to somewhere like that in time and will die. But yeah, they, they are fairly self-perpetuating. They're very fast breeders. Strange really, well, they are, are very, very fast breeders. Some of the other earthworms have about five young a year and live for about 30 years. Things like the lobworms, which are, the, well, they're our only species of deep, Worm in the UK is the lobworm. 
And what is the average life of your common or garden earthworm? You're looking there at, probably if you averaged across all the species, um, probably about three to four years. So you've basically got a very large variety. Some of the some of the humid compost worms have got a fairly low average lifespan because, as you've noted, once the humus wears out, like they're scattered in the garden, the majority of them die, so that's bringing their age down. And then so you've got things like the lobworm, which may live for 20-odd years. Wow. So in terms of my compost bin, I think that there is a warning not to put things like lemon peel or anything that's kind of acidic onto your compost so because that will discourage those worms is that actually true or has have studies been conducted into that citrus fruit peel is not great because it's quite acidic um and you know as we've mentioned worms don't like acidity although it doesn't seem to deter them too much. I mean, another thing that's not great is if you put too many grass cuttings in, because you get a big bundle of grass cuttings together, they heat up very, very quickly and start to decaying, and the amount of heat they produce is not great for the worms either. So if you're bunging lots and lots of grass cuttings in, it's a good idea to bung a little bit of soil or something in with it just to break it down a bit so it doesn't get quite so hot. And also on one of my compost heaps, it's really the one that where I just chuck wood. I call it a compost heap. It's not at all. It's it's literally a tucked away corner where I just chuck big branches and things. And that has got a colony of slow worms living in it. Are they actually worms? No, slow worms are a type of reptile. So they're basically a lizard that has no legs as opposed to a snake, which is also, of course, a reptile. So yeah, they're, they're a legless lizard, but they've yeah, been called slow worms because I suppose they look very very similar to worms and in fact they are one of the things that eat worms so are there any worms that appear in our garden that we might not want there are potentially two if you're a very garden proud person and you particularly like your lawn you probably won't like the gray worm because the gray worm is the only worm in the uk that makes this a worm car so very proud gardeners probably don't like gray worms i quite happy with them, I'm not born proud, and yeah, they do all the other really useful things that earthworms do. But the sort you don't really want around are the flatworms, because the, the flatworms are, well, their favourite food is earthworms, and they have a profound effect on the number of earthworms. It's been known that if they've got introduced to an area, you can see within, you know, within a year, you've had over a 30% drop in the number of earthworms in that soil. So by flatworms getting in, they are basically decreasing the fertility of your ground. Crikey. Are they an, a native species? There are two fairly rare native species, but there are now at least eight non-native species which have effectively become naturalised in this country and uh, are spreading around. And it's the spread of those that's been really noted for its impact on the earthworm populations. And where did they come in? Did they just come in with imported plants? That's more or less exactly what it is. I mean, the bulk of them actually originate from Australasia. And most of them are called the Australian something or the New Zealand something. There was one found recently called the Obama worm, which is actually from South America. It's not named after the president. It's named after a local phrase. <laughs> um, and that was actually found at a garden centre coming out of a plant pot. And it's believed that the majority of these kind of invasives come in in plant pots. What a lot of people don't realise is that in this country, we have a one billion pound trade deficit in plants and pots. And that's not one just for going inside the house. It's like if you go and buy a pallet of petunias or whatever it is you buy from the garden centre. We have a billion pound trade deficit. To put that more figures on it, we sell about 300 million pounds worth of potted plants overseas and we import 1.3 billion worth into this country so that's kind of very very stark and you realize how much is coming in now a lot of these flatworms have already got established in continental europe and um, because the bulk of our trade is with mainland europe and of course because of the various treaties etc that are in place you can't stop things coming in you can't put customs checks on them so Think very hard about what you buy if you're going to a garden centre and what might be in it. And it's well worth having a look in your pot. We've actually had people who have reported to us finding mole crickets 
which are you know, pretty big beasties, you know, a couple of inches long, inside plant pots that have come in from places like Italy. Wow. Well, actually, it's funny you say that. We bought a bag of salad from a well-known online grocer and inside it we found a big... I don't actually know to this day what it was and I'm not going to tell you the story about what we did with it, but suffice to say it did live a happy life. But um, it was about oh three inches long and it kind of looked a bit grasshoppery. So I, you're probably the man that would actually be able to tell me that. I might, might try and dig out a photo and send it to you. But yeah, it is incredible actually what you can find on things that have been imported. So in terms of, it, this could be a daft question, but flatworms, are they flat? Certainly, yes, in comparison to the... I mean, that, that's why an earthworm is also called a roundworm. So they are kind of cylindrical, whereas the flatworm is, yeah, it is very sort of flattish. To be perfectly honest, I mean, the Obama worm looks almost like a lump of slime that moves. <laughs> yeah, so they are very, very, very flat. And again, is there somewhere... Can people go onto the Opal website to get an identification for those? No, I'm just trying to think... Some of the flatworms you will actually find on the environment, food and rural affairs site because they are species that they're asking people to look out for because we are still trying to keep them out of the country. But there isn't really a definitive place for that. If people send them in to us, we can often get them identified. But we can't guarantee it because it also depends on the level of resolution of the picture. And again, as with a lot of invertebrates, some of them you can only actually find out what they are if you cut them apart and look at some of their internal organs. So if people suspect that they do have flatworms, um, is there anything that they can do to suppress the population or is the horse bolted by that point? Probably the horse is bolted. It's like the harlequin ladybird on a, on a national scale. On the scale of in your garden, you could probably gather them up and dispose of them humanely. Many people have probably heard the story, oh, cut a worm in two. And you end up with two worms. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's unfortunately, it's a myth. It's possible that one half may live, but the standard earthworm, because of the difference of its organs, it's got five hearts, an earthworm, so it's not losing its heart, but one end is the sort of the head that does the eating, and one end is the end that, you know, after it's done the eating, it comes out of, and you cut it in two, and the, the, the tail end always dies, and it depends how much is left with the head end, whether it survives. However, a flatworm, Chop it into pieces and you get five flat worms, six flat oh, worms no. or whatever. So chopping it up is actually increasing your population. Oh, it's propagating <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, no. Well, I did want to ask you the question about chopping an earthworm in half, but I did think that in this day and age, most people knew that that wasn't the case, but <laughs> maybe not. But I can't believe that you can actually create more more flatworms. That's like a horror film. Um, I think that's brilliant. I, I really do appreciate your time because who knew that worms were quite, I mean, I knew they were great. I love them, but I didn't know how fascinating they were. So thank you again. Where can we go to find out more about earthworms and bugs in general? If you want to find out more about bugs in general, then I, I would actually recommend a good starting place is something like the Bug Life website itself. We have information about an awful lot of bugs. We have some basic identification things, so you can follow the classification and work out it is a wood louse. And you could then go off and find somewhere to get in more detail if you want to really identify what particular type of woodlouse it is, that type of thing. So I think it's a good, a good first starter place. Uh, the Royal Entomological Society has got some good information, though. It is kind of quite technical. Uh, they use a lot of Latin names. They tend to use Latin names first rather than the common names, which makes it a little harder for the general person to, to manage. Opal have quite a number of different guides for identifying things on there. Field Studies Council do some really good guides, but they're they're handheld guides and you have to pay for those. Uh, But they have got some very good guides for identifying things. And in fact, they have a very good earthworm identification guide. And I believe they actually have a flatworm ID guide. But again, these are not available online. You have to buy them. Is there anything else going on at the moment at Bug Life that you'd like to mention? Any events coming up? There's a lot going on on pollinators at the moment, which of course are also hugely important for our gardens. And of course, our gardens are becoming hugely important for pollinators. Recent surveys have actually shown that we have more diversity now of pollinators in the urban environment than we do in the rural environment. And that's telling you something about basically the way we've been treating our land in general, the 
piling on of pesticides and herbicides on it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is really. It's um, it's all crazy. I mean, I was just kind of wondering as an aside, really. The one time that I can kind of see the a sense in using chemicals widely in a garden environment or even in a kind of large garden setting and it's the only time that I've ever used it myself is the use of a herbicide if I was wanting to establish a meadow I mean what can you do in that instance are there any ways around it or do you just have to bite the bullet and do the horrible thing to start with in the knowledge that you're improving the environment in the longer term yeah, me- meadow creation is one of those areas where it is incredibly difficult to do it without using a herbicide. It can be done, but it involves a lot more hard work. And obviously, if you're doing it on a large scale, it's probably a lot more cost because you're probably going to have to bring in rotifates and things. But basically, then the best way to do it, because you know, on the whole, wildflowers don't like the, the lovely rich soils most of us have in our gardens. They like a much poorer quality soil. So inverting your soil is a very good thing to do. So you scoop it down, turn it upside down, so you bring more of the subsoil to the top and then sowing it. But also you need to clear that area of things and get rid of any sort of you know, perennial roots that are in there before sowing your meadow in. So it, it's much, it's a much bigger, harder hand job, although it's good for, good exercise for you to do it that way. So that was Paul Hetherington and I can't thank him enough for his time because talking to him was such a joy and as I said it did confirm that I do have a well-founded love for earthworms in my garden. I think you could hear my incredulity when I was speaking to him when he mentioned there was a 75% increase in plant material if you have worms in your soil. I think that I could probably understand that there might be more plants on the surface area of your garden but to actually learn that it increases the amount of plant growth per plant was such an eye-opener really and also we touched on the subject of mulching and if you don't actually know what mulching is it is something that you should be all over really because it is one of the best things you can do in your garden so it pretty much involves during the winter months putting a layer on top of your soil it does many many things it mainly kind of suppresses weeds but it does condition your soil and it obviously does feed the worms in your soil and it makes the whole area much easier to work on the following year. So I can't stress the importance of doing that enough because I've seen personally how much it increases the diggability, the friability of your soil. And as Paul said, there are numerous different things that you can mulch your soil with and he was suggesting that maybe it's better to stick to something that is actually native to the location where you'll be applying the mulch. So for example, if you have a woodland area in your garden, you'll be looking to put things like rotted leaf mould down. But I don't know how it works in terms of importing things. Obviously Paul was saying don't use things like the shells that you can put down that you can buy, but also don't put down anything particularly synthetic or, or alien to your actual garden but I don't know how that works in terms of putting down manures and I'd be really interested if anybody has heard of any studies that have been done on that and listening to Paul uh, list the number of species that predate earthworms it really brings into focus how important they are and um, it's interesting that fungicides are detrimental to worms because they're probably one of the seemingly most innocuous things that you can actually use in your garden and in fact a lot of fungicides are found in the form of sprays that you'll put onto your roses so it's interesting to bear in mind that even when you think that you're just treating black spot or powdery mildew if you're applying a chemical then it does have an impact on things even in a different kind of immediate environment to where you're applying the chemicals so it is important that we consider the actions that we're taking in our garden and the wider impact of those and the other thing that he mentioned that was really fascinating to me which I probably should have known but came as a bolt from the blue is the fact that we have a one billion pound trade deficit when it comes to plants in this country and I think that when we leave the EU we might find that it becomes more difficult and or expensive to buy plants from overseas so perhaps it is time that we looked into probably growing more plants in this country to sell but also that it's really important when you do go and buy your plants that you are making a conscious effort to try and source plants that come from the UK because that will be supporting local growers and also you will be curbing the import of pests so I know that's a real long-term problem to which there's no easy solution but I I do think we should be encouraged to buy UK grown plants as and when we can. 
Well, it really is worth checking out the Bug Life website because they do have a great amount of information on there, including information about their latest campaign, which is called Get Britain Buzzing. And that's all about encouraging pollinators. So that is well worth checking out. Joining Bug Life is only £3 a month. So if that is something that you wanted to support and were interested in, it is well worth a look. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed talking to Paul. If you have any questions, do email me or go to the website to find out more information. For more information, visit the Roots and All website at rootsandall.co.uk. To download more episodes, visit iTunes, your favourite podcast provider or get them direct from our website. <laughs>